The Marines Memorial honors the legacy of military service, and we're a commemorative partner with the Department of Defense celebration or commemoration of 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. And tonight, we honor the veterans of the Vietnam War. We have a full program. First, we have our speaker, which I'll introduce in a minute, Paul Bud Buka. Then we're going to show a commemorative film, a documentary, The Last Days in Vietnam. And then we're going to party. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to go up to the 10th floor for a big party where you have food, drinks, dessert, and you can even dance, because there's going to be period music back there. Yeah. But since we're going to show that movie, I thought I might recognize the person that was on the last helicopter in Vietnam, coming out of Vietnam, Rich Paddock. Rich, would you stand up? There he is. I guess you... You're in the movie. It's great. All right. Now to introduce our guest of honor, Paul Bud Buka. He wears the Medal of Honor. He's the past president of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. His citation is part of your program. And when you read it, you'll find out what a hero he was. He led a rifle company on a reconnaissance in force and got into a battle that lasted all night. And when the sun came up the next morning, he saw they had decimated a battalion of North Vietnamese. But I want to tell you about the man. He graduated from West Point in 1965. I think he was second in his class. He was All-American two times and captain of the swim team. And when he graduated, he was, instead of going into the Army, he was going to Stanford to get his MBA. And he went to Airborne and Ranger School in between academic years. And when he graduated, from Stanford, he reported to the 101st Airborne in November of 1967, and they were ready to go to Vietnam. Like I said, I'm not going to talk about his Vietnam experience. When he finished Vietnam, he was assigned to West Point as an instructor. And then he resigned his commission in 1972, and he went to work for Ross Perot. And he went to Iran for eight years. He was in the Middle East. And then to Paris in 1980, where he formed his own international consulting company. And then he came back to the States, and he got into real estate development. He formed a company called Terra Mac to LLC in real estate development. And he had time to work for the Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel Company, where he supervised the reorganization of that company. He was CEO of the largest manufacturer of lead-free ammunition for the military and for law enforcement. He was appointed as a civilian's aide to the Secretary of the Army, where he worked with the Accession Command to advise him on accessing recruiting during the war. He's a member of the Fisher House Foundation and Intrepid Fallen Heroes Fund, which supports military fam families and wounded warriors. And he does a lot with the veterans, I'll tell you that. 
He's in, he's in the International Swimming Hall of Fame and he's an inductee in the U.S. Army Hall of Fame, the Ranger Hall of Fame. You can see that Bud Buka has done a lot with his life, as so many Vietnam veterans have, and please help me welcome Bud Buka to the stage. Thank you. Oh, please, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. When I, when I came into this room before everybody else did, I walked up on the stage, and I don't know how it happened, but when I saw this flag, I saw some bitch, let me tell you. And I started realizing that, no, he's not around here, but there must be an element of him and me. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, um, thank you, Mike, for that very gracious invitation, and I accept your overture for my men. Uh, I have no delusions why I get invited to go places. It's because of this. And for the men that earned it, I thank you. Um, when I'm asked to talk about Vietnam and sort of remember those days, there's certain special things that I remember. Uh, I remember that that was a time when this country was torn apart, not necessarily in 1967 by the war, although at Stanford the students thought it was the time to tear this country apart. But I found out about the students. I was coming back from the swimming team where I was coaching them. And I saw all these students lined up and there was a North Vietnamese flag upside down at a table and they were taking blood. You went into a room and you gave blood. And on the other side of the square, there was another table with the American Red Cross. And I saw some of my swimmers in the line with the NVA flag. I said, what are you doing? That's the wrong place. You should be over there in the Red Cross. And they were like one third of the way back from the table. So there's two thirds of the line. And they said, oh, I'm sorry. And they moved. The whole line moved. They just left the NBA thing, which they were supposedly really worried about. And they moved to the Red Cross and gave blood there. And that night I listened to the news and they only filmed the part that showed the long line with the NBA flag. They didn't show the, fly, the, the scene after all the students had moved to support the Red Cross. And I realized that we maybe are judging people too harshly. There is a thing about judging commitment of force that oftentimes we reserve for the old. In hindsight, when there's a draft, maybe the commitment of force is a decision in which the young count more. Because what I found out at that time of being at Stanford, they didn't really have a cause on the political side. They were just wondering what it was we were trying to achieve. Six months into Vietnam, I had received my first casualties and I saw a picture. Uh, they became somewhat notorious in the press because I was crying, because I had seen my first man that I had recruited to join my company, Delta Company 3rd of the 187th, and I had seen him sit up on the stretcher after Regan Morris had set in with his eyes open and his mouth open. And I realized that that moment, I had to write the letter and I could not say specifically what it was we had to achieve to come home. No one was willing to make that decision. And I'll be very blunt with you, and since that time, only one president of this country has who said, kick them out of Kuwait in 37 days, we were on planes coming home. And then in our infinite wisdom, we vilified him and he didn't get reelected. <laughs> but think about that. What was the mission? What was the objective? The CEOs, the commander's job is to define the objective for which the organization is to be organized and to achieve. And that was missing. And as a result, we served in that war for each other and for our families at home, trusting in the wisdom that this was something we should have done and needed to be done. But when I was coming home, I was at Tonson and they said to me, you know, you're gonna be the only officer on Seaboard Airways, you're heading to Sacramento two days before Thanksgiving, and we just want you to know that we've enjoyed having you here and all that, and I'm sitting there thinking, no, 
I'm in Vietnam. No one tells me they enjoyed having me there like I went to a party. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking at getting out. That was what I was looking for. And so I got on the plane, and what I found was these were the hardcore survivors. You all remember them getting ready to go to the plane. They looked at each other. They didn't know each other because we were individually, and they said, we made it. When we reported in, so many times, the E1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, and 5s would look around and say, who's been here 12 months? And no one had been there 12 months. And right away, the brain starts cackling. If no one's been here 12 months, where are they? Where's everybody that's been here 11 months? Oh, they're not here either. And pretty soon you got down, you found one long-time guy been there eight months. And you're saying, something's missing. There's something missing. Everybody's supposed to be a short-timer at some time. No, 58,000 never were short-timers. So when they got on the plane, they had this combat slouch. When they walked up, they had longer hair, and it was not tucked behind their ears. It was there, and they had their sloppy hats, and they felt good. They were dirty, hardcore, and survivors, and they were going home. Because I was an officer, they told me to sit in the last seat. And during the entire flight, they didn't lose that hardcore slouch, that dirty, I made it look, until a man came over the loudspeaker and said, 30 minutes to ETA, Sacramento. And all of a sudden, people put their seats up straight, tucked their hair behind their ears, dusted off their boots for so help me God. They pulled out rags and were wiping the brown dust off allegedly black, white combat boots. And then they started pulling out medals. And they all put the CIB they received up top. Why? That's 45 days in combat. Most medals will be a matter of minutes, seconds, maybe a few hours, not 45 days. And that was their badge of honor. And I looked at them and I said, this is unbelievable. The transformation. They were coming home to the country they had served and served proudly. And the plane touched down. The back door opened in front of me, and I said, I'll stay on board until everybody's off, and everybody went down. As I was starting to step on the gangway down from the plane, I heard this noise. Crack, bang. Everybody, knock off the noise. Enlisted men on the right, officers on the left, we'll get you out of here as soon as possible, but knock it off. And I looked at that line of people. And the stiff, straight backs went back to that combat slouch. No one said, welcome home. There was a sparkly sign that said it, but there was no lights on it, so you couldn't see it. And all of a sudden, I saw from the front of the line, people were doing something. And I realized they were turning around, and they were hugging each other. Until the man in front of me turned around and said, sir, welcome home. He grabbed me. He said, I love you. And I turned around, and there was one guy, about five foot six, wearing a silver star, his bronze star with V, and he was a medic. And he looked at me, and he said, sir, welcome home, and said, I love you. And we embraced, and he cried, and I cried. Little did I know that that was a hallmark of what we were going to do from that moment and similar moments for the rest of our lives. Whenever we gathered, we hugged. And we said, welcome home. Sometimes we said, we love you, and sometimes we didn't, but everybody knew we did. And we didn't get parades. We didn't get, thank you for your service. We were left alone. Sure, there were horrific things, but by the way, there were horrific things that some veterans in World War II experienced. And that's not really what we focus on. What we focus on is this wonder of millions of young men and a few young women who gather all across this great land and see each other and say, welcome home, even though they just saw each other at the bank that morning. And they hug and they remember. And when we decided we were going to have a memorial, we built it. We were forced to make some changes to accommodate those who thought our memorial wasn't quite right. And I will admit, 
I wondered why did ours have to be in a hole? <laughs> and the guys that formed it, Jack Wheeler and Jan Scruggs, later on I ate some very humble pies and now I know why, you knew better. Because it became an intimate memorial. The same as our relationship with each other. And then when we said, we're going to have a parade, I remember a group saying, we're going to do it in New York. And I said, no one will show. God, how can you have a ticker tape parade? Maybe the cops tell you, sorry, you can't go beyond this part. It's a red light. I will tell you later on, Mayor Giuliani and I were the grand marshals of a New York parade, and the cops did say that. On Veterans Day, they said, no, you got to obey the lights. We said, and the mayor said, what? what do you mean? This is a parade. We don't obey the lights. The cops said, yes, you do, Mr. Mayor it was our parade. But the first parade, when we planned a parade knowing no one would show, we marched over the Brooklyn Bridge to gather in Brooklyn, and we were coming across that. Mayor Koch was the mayor, a World War II veteran. And we were all talking. We said, what happens when we get to the other side and no one's there? And what we said, yes, there will be. We'll be there. We don't need someone else to come to our parade. It is our parade. We're throwing it. We decide who's coming, and they're coming, and that's all that matters. We mattered to each other. And we started marching. Mayor Koch came over and said to me, he said, uh, the Medal of Honor guys I know have been asked to lead the parade. What do I do? I said, with all due respect, Mr. Mayor, you push George Lang. We're going to be going uphill, and that's tough in a wheelchair. Mayor Koch got behind that wheelchair in the entire march. When people were yelling to him by name, he never took his eyes off the road in front of George. He did not take a hand off to wave. He did his role of helping us to have one of ours experience the wonder of a parade from a wheelchair. <laughs> And that's the way it's supposed to be. We came to realize it did not matter what the politicians thought of us. It didn't matter what people we've never met thought of us. What mattered was what do our peers think of us? The men and women with whom we served, what do they think of us? And we gathered together and we formed a force that has still left its mark in this country to this day of people who do something differently. And the relationship that we found with each other became the greatest asset any of us had. I learned that in 40 years after March 16th, 1968, I got a call from a man that's in the citation. He's the one that called me up and I said, Calvin, I hate to tell you this, play dead. I hope to God I'll be able to see you in the morning. He said, got it, sir. Click. And Calvin lay across his lieutenant, both severely wounded by an NVA Claymore mine as they were carrying the wounded out to an LZ. And he lay across his lieutenant all night long until the morning when the NVA sat on him and ate their breakfast. And think about that. Had he not had a weak pulse due to all the bleeding, they would have known that he was alive. And as soon as they pulled out, Calvin saw one left behind, and he did with his last ounce of his entire strength, he used his bayonet to make sure that he didn't sound the alarm. And he crawled into the thing, and I heard him yelling, Captain, we're here. And we got Calvin. We brought him back. He got on that helicopter, and he was gone with the other 10 men who had given their lives. And I never saw him again until 40 years later when he called. And he says, sir, I need help. I said, Calvin, what do you need? What, do you need? what can I do for you? He said, I'm still having bad dreams. I said, go to the VA. You've got counseling. And he said, he said I can't. I don't have benefits. I said, what do you mean you don't have benefits? You have a silver star. You have a purple heart. You serve with the Delta Company. You're an airborne ranger. What do you mean you don't? He said, sir, I have no benefits. I gave it up so I could go home. 
And it turns out that some lieutenant was assigned to him at Fort Carson who saw all his wounds in his back and concocted the story that he had been a coward running away. And that story got back to Calvin's father, who was a Nipmunk Indian tribe leader, that the insult his son would come back to the tribe with the markings of a coward. And he lived with that as long as he could live until he called me. We got him his medals. We got him his disability check, $25,000 retroactive, 80% going forward. And when they were awarding the medal to him at Cheshire, Connecticut, he took it off and I said, oh my God, he's gonna throw it. He walked up to the congressman and said, thank you for being here, you can leave now. And he then turned to me and said, sir, will you pin it on? And I pinned it on and he cried, the entire tribal elders did, and he told the story of missing his father because his father was not there to see him recognized for what he had done. He didn't care about the politicians. He didn't care about the leaders. He cared about his father, part of us. And I called Calvin and I said, you know, keep that medal because you're going to have to be honored by someone far greater than me. And we had a West Point Society gathering in Connecticut, and I said, bring that medal, put a coat on, braid your hair, look sharp. And the head of the Coast Guard Academy, a two-star at the time, said, I will present this medal to a warrior from Vietnam. And as the Vietnam veterans in West Point Society gathered, they had no idea what was going on, the role of adjutant. The man said, tension orders. Everybody jumped out of their seats. He said, front and center, Calvin Heath. Calvin marched forward. And by God, I never saw him stand that straight and that proudly in the entire time I knew him. He was standing like he was that 17-year-old kid that dropped out of high school to volunteer to go to Vietnam. And that standing ovation went on and on and on. And as they picked the awards and prizes for the night, they gave him two tickets, round trip, Virgin Airways, first class to London. A one week stay in the Browns Hotel, London, for two. They gave him award after award. And he was crying and smiling. And when he left, I called him the next day. I said, what's it like? He said, I said, when are you going to London? He said, I'm not going to London. He said, I gave it to my brother and sister. I said, why? He said, I gave him the disability pay too, sir. He said to me, I need to say thank you to someone who didn't need the medals to understand that I was okay, that I had served our country. And he said, sir, you know, I get free coffee all over Cheshire, Connecticut. I said, well, what'd you learn from that? He said, I learned our friends are those who need no medals to welcome us home from having served them. Very profound thought for a kid who was then 57. And that's Vietnam. That's the legacy we have. We do not need, and we prove to the generations yet to come, they too do not need that slap on the back from a person really too busy to pause. Thank you for your service, but I can't stop because I've got to do things I'm important. The Vietnam veterans proved that didn't matter. What matters is when you see those with whom you served, even if you have not seen them for 50 years, you reach out, you embrace, and say, welcome home, brother. And so when we gather in a place like this, let's think what we should take with us. And I always tell people, it's not, it's not the money that you give to a veterans group. It's not the check you write. For God's sakes, you may make billions, and the check you give them for $1,000 or $1 might be insignificant to you. You have no idea how much money you'll earn. So that's not really priceless. That's generous, but that's it. 
and the stuff we give each other. For God's sakes, we get things, couches and old desks. I mean, I, when I was a young lieutenant, God, with things that people would give me, I'd say, my God, they should be throwing it away, not giving it to me. But they gave it to me. And I said, thank you. But they had more stuff later on to give. Willie Nelson, when they took everything he owned, he said, he's there on his thing, the little $5 lawn chair and a to stiff a camera in his face and said, what's it like to lose everything? He started laughing. He says, what do you mean to lose everything? I have my guitar. I have my health. I have my music. They're just taking the stuff, and I'll fill it up again. So what is it? We have one thing in life that's truly priceless. One thing. And unfortunately, it is usually far more priceless than we would have it be. And that's our time. When you give your time, you are giving the gift of your most precious asset. And that's what these veterans need today. They need you to stop and embrace them as you embraced each other and lead them into understanding, yes, it is something great what they have done. Regardless of what people at a restaurant might say to them or what they might read in a newspaper or anything else, yes, it is great. You went where this country asked you to go. You do not know where it is on a map. You can't speak the language and you don't know the culture. But you went why? You trust this government and its people to send you where you need to go. And that's the lesson we learned. That's the lesson we brought home, and that's the lesson we can teach others. When you leave here, take the time when you see a veteran, when you see a soldier, to ask them not, thank you for your service, I'm busy, I'm out of here, but how are you? I think of those that came home from, with me and they came home with you. When they were standing in the airport, they'd never been to a commercial airport. They were out of Ducktown, Tennessee. Hell, the last thing they saw was their uncle's car. And they're standing there looking at that thing, and they're looking at their thing, and it says NSA. Uh, I have no idea what that says. They're looking up there, and they're looking for Ducktown, Tennessee, because I got to get to Ducktown, because mom's there, and they're having a party, and by God, I can't be late. And you stop and say, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to Ducktown, Tennessee, but I can't find it. And you say, well, let's see. Let me see your ticket. And you see NSH, and you say, I think it's Nashville, Tennessee, that you're going to fly to. Is that close to Ducktown? Oh, yeah, that's great. I know where Nashville is. Good. And you're going to look for Nashville. Come on. You're going to go to gate three. I'll take you there. You may have just taken this kid from the fear of missing mom's first meal that they had prepared in over a year for him, where all the family was gathered to hug them and say, welcome home, you may have just made it possible for him or her to be there on time. And what did it cost you? A little time. So when you come to this gathering, let's all leave resolved to reach out to these young veterans and help them come to understand. It's not who gets a book published. It's not who makes a movie. It's the men and women with whom you served and the respect and love that you feel for one another that is the greatest asset that this country gives you in exchange for the privilege of wearing the uniform of the United States of America and serving its citizens where others fear to go. God bless you all for being here today and may you leave here so committed. Thank you very much. Taking it upon myself that wherever I go, I do try to do one thing like this a week as payback to my men. Uh, a Vietnam vet, carrier based pilot, produced this book The American Experience in Vietnam Reflections of an Era. And I'd like to leave this to General Mike for all he does for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is going in our library. This is going in our library. Yeah. That was terrific, but I tell you, you removed us. It really, really did.